Hello, we are live. This is Ryan Munn with Interchain Live, and we're talking about insurance marketplaces and blockchain today, how to help farmers with blockchain technology. I've got the honor to speak with Sid, the CEO of Arbol. How are you doing, Sid? I'm good. Um, thanks for having me on. Uh, Ryan. It's, been, uh, it's an honor to be on, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to company. Awesome. With you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, and I'm really excited about the work that you're doing. Um, so let's get right into it just a little bit. Give us the, you know, uh, 60 seconds. What is Arbol? Sure. So Arbol is uh, a company that aims to address a very important need, and that's for protection from adverse weather events. So instead of the traditional way insurance is done, where a, an adjuster comes to your farm and checks the damage to your crop, that process is expensive, prone to fraud, prone to a lot of inefficiencies, we use data to make those loss payments. So the payments are made for an adverse weather event, uh, event such as a drought or a flood come straight from the weather data. And this is a form of insurance known as parametric insurance. We are combining parametric insurance with the concepts of blockchain and smart contracts, whereby a smart contract can automatically read weather data, decide on whether the threshold that you chose was met, and then <clears throat> make the appropriate payments. So we are empowering both sides to get together and create these weather uh, you know, uh, protection contracts, if you will, without the need for a very extensive infrastructure of agents and uh, government subsidies and so on. Excellent, excellent. So we're really enabling the free private marketplace to interoperate transparently with each other from the farmers, the insured, and the insurers uh, yeah. to use data to get the best results. Absolutely. And uh, a trillion dollars of crops go uninsured every single year. Wow. And that's what the need is here, is a lot of the world's basic livelihood. And this is not just uh, in, in, in emerging markets, a lot of developed markets, a lot of pockets of the U.S. as well. Farmers are left uh, to their own devices. And it is, uh, you know, it's very uh, difficult to plan or to save or to uh, you know, move forward with expansion and growth if every few years a random weather event can take out your uh, you know, years right. of income. So. Right, right. All right, well, so I definitely wanna dive deeper into that, but before we go too far, I wanna know a little bit more about who you are, Sid. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. What brought you to where you are today? Sure, so um, I came out of college in 2005. I came out of Harvard and went straight into uh, in interest rate markets uh, uh, at uh, JP Morgan. I was there for five years, you know, all sorts of different uh, macroeconomic uh, type uh, mark, uh, roles and markets, uh, treasury bonds and so on. And then uh, I always wanted to be in commodities. Uh, I always found them fascinating. So uh, in uh, you know about uh, nine years ago, I left uh, my bank job and joined what was then a startup uh, hedge fund. Um, I was the first employee uh, of the commodities group, and uh, we uh, you know did well. It was uh, I learned a lot. Uh, we basically traded the entire commodity complex from a fundamental standpoint. So looking at how energy markets work, how agriculture markets and metals markets works. And uh, you know, after that, I got um, uh, a chance to be, be build my own um, you know, uh, little trading operation. Uh, we managed up to, you know, um, at uh, Castleton Commodities. And uh, at Castleton, you know, uh, the focus was building an agricultural futures trading desk. It was very uh, global in nature, grains, soft, livestock. Uh, and uh, what that gave me is a very broad, uh, you know, picture of how these different agricultural markets work. But at the same time, really understanding each and every uh, commodities logistics, uh, production, demand, uh, you know, on a region by region basis. Right. And then, yeah. So, so you really, a little bit of a sideline here, but you must really understand what we're talking about when people in the blockchain space are talking about tokenization of everything. Because when you're talking about the commodities markets, I mean, you're just looking at numbers and, and, and things on, you know, on a screen and everything is a, a, a tokenized contract um, again, commodity long before we got into cryptocurrency. 
For sure. Uh, these are some of the oldest uh, future, futures markets that exist. Uh, you know, some of these grain futures uh, prices, you can get up to uh, back going back to the 1200 AD. <laughs> so wow. the, the, this concept of, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and this was all started to help farmers uh, reduce income volatility, price volatility. Right. So if I grow corn, and uh, you know, I don't know what price I will get at harvest when I plant. That's like a few months later. This yeah. is a way. Essentially, it is a uh, type of an insurance contract. We don't call it that. But that's the concept. I'm going to insure right. myself against price drops. And yep. so, you know, if the price of corn goes below four dollars, I'm still guaranteed the four dollars per right. bushel. So that's the idea behind all these futures markets. And call it insurance, call it gambling. It's uh, all numbers <laughs> game. Well, there's, a, there's a difference, though. There's a very important difference between gambling and what uh, this is, right? This this mm -hmm. has an underlying economic need. When two people play roulette, there's no underlying economic need on either side. Right. And it's done for fun. This yeah. is done to actually protect the income volatility. And, you know, in the U.S., these markets have been around since the 1850s. And it's a big kind of help to the farmers to be able to plan their next season, to plan what uh, price you're getting. You know, our right. lives are in, in, in cities and urban areas are extremely insured. Like if you take a step back and think your home insurance, your car insurance, all these things, right? Right. If, for these guys, the, their basic livelihood is the crop and they don't know how much they're gonna produce and they don't know uh, at what price. So the right. futures markets help to you know manage that price exposure. Yeah. Um, and then after Castleton, I was at uh, 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 Citadel, where I was uh, overseeing, um, helping oversee uh, you know deployment of uh, cutting edge quantitative models from machine learning uh, to you know uh, other statistical techniques into the fundamental commodity space. So using the best techniques out there for uh, analyzing these markets and including. Uh, you know, obviously, a uh, decent bit of exposure to weather, and which has, which is a common theme in all commodity markets, as you might imagine. Uh, understanding, you know, how weather operates and um, how you know weather data interacts with these markets. Uh, right. I, I like to say, with everything, it's garbage in, garbage out. So one of the things you're just alluding to is, is uh, you know, this capability of balancing the interests between the farmers, and the insurers, and the demand side, right? The buyers of the commodities. Sure. And uh, but in order to predict, you know, one of the things they're trying to solve is the farmers don't know how much they're going to produce at what price. The best way to limit those variables is for the proper data and machine learning applied to be able to make as accurate as possible predictions. Absolutely. And that. Oh, did we lose you there? Is the signal to the farmers and the demand guys, right? If, if there's can a shortage you, sorry, prices. Can you, can you repeat that? I think we lost you for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, the, the prices in these markets gives the signals, right, to the different participants. If the price of corn is high and the price of soybeans is low, farmers will plant more corn, thus adding to the supply next year. And that's the function of these markets is they enable this balance to be reached and, you know, lots of places don't have these kinds of markets and what you see is you know rampant uh, oversupply then rampant shortages and I can name you lots of different commodity markets in other countries where you just don't have this smoothing effect and so prices fluctuate uh, a lot and right. uh, you know uh, and then you have shortages and all these things so it's these markets do serve a very important uh, function but one of the things that I would like to point out is, you know, these markets were again made in, you know, hundred plus years ago. Yeah. They 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 serve like a, a global sort of picture now. So the corn trades in Chicago, but it sort of serves as sort of, you know a global marker for corn. So people in in all sorts of different places use the corn market to manage their price exposure, but. What happens to your local area is not going to really affect the corn price. Uh, you know, so if you are a farmer in Mozambique or, <clears throat> you know, or, or, or say uh, Thailand, you may have a bad harvest. You're not big enough uh, to affect that uh, corn price. So that causes this disconnect where local 
weather conditions, local supply and demand is uh, much more difficult to manage that exposure. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with Arbol is uh, have a way to uh, manage your local weather exposure, which is not going to be reflected in the big, you know, futures markets like wheat, corn, soybeans. Right. So are you helping the farmers predict or decide what they're going to grow in the next cycle and maybe even how they're going to rotate things? So that's something that we are planning on adding over time to the platform. We, we envision a platform where farmers, uh, you know, obviously come for the basic insurance, which is protection from, you know, financial protection. So if a drought happens, I want to get paid uh, X thousand dollars and that's my, you know, safety net. But we want to go beyond that, of course. And as, as farmers, uh, you know, come to our platform, we want to provide them with more uh you know added analytics such as yeah, like what what's the crop situation looking like the crop you grow competitor crops other sort of events happening in your region and also you know what's going on in terms of weather forecasts in your region these are not uh, you know that's not something that uh, we you know want to uh, influence the farmer in any way this is just added uh, information for them to help them decide on uh you know their next crop or also you know, what uh, sort of uh, actions they can take to, you know, prepare if there's a drought coming and so on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about how you guys are making this happen. You've got a pretty strong team around you and uh, I'd love to learn a little bit more about uh, how you guys have met and come together and, and uh, you know, what's really, what, what's unique that's going to make you guys successful here. Sure. I think our team is one of the you know key reasons why I believe we can make this happen. So one of the things I be, uh, you know uh, before I get into the team, it, one of the things that happens uh, I think in many sort of tech businesses is the the product obviously is a big part of the focus, but then you need to execute that product into the market in how do you get users to actually use it how do you get the key stakeholders to buy into it and that's what i think separates a tech product that uh stays uh you know uh, essentially a tech project versus what becomes a company and so what i wanted to do was bring together people from a number of different disciplines who are going to make uh you know the execution of this plan happen so, uh, you know, Ben's our CTO. He is, uh, uh, you know, he's extremely uh, talented programmer, but also beyond being a programmer, he has actually managed uh, other programmers before. He has experience in building large software projects, which was important to me. And uh, we met through a friend of friends. He was very interested in doing, uh, you know, something new in the blockchain space, uh, something that made an impact. And, uh, you know, uh, it, we started working on it uh, pretty early on. And you know the the important thing there is that we want to make sure that the uh, product that comes out of the tech side really is uh, well suited for the end users we are targeting the the banks, the insurers, the farmers, and all the other uh, stakeholders. And so you know blockchain is how we make it happen, but we don't want the user to have to know blockchain. We don't want right. the user to have to know what cryptocurrencies are and so on. Blockchain right. is the tool that will make all of this uh, happen in the background, but at the front end, the user should have an extremely simple intuitive interface that uh, so you know, they can use. So let me ask you something. This is kind of an interesting conversation on its own as far as, you know, to what extent do we need to push user education and understanding of blockchain versus just getting it involved behind the scenes? Because while I agree with you that the user doesn't necessarily need to understand that blockchain is there, um, in order for a user to differentiate your marketplace versus another marketplace, or you know, learn to differentiate what organizations or services to trust, there, there does need to be some underlying understanding. And yet at the same time, there's a lot of sort of ways of implementing blockchain that have more or less advantage. And so what, what, would you, what do you say to that sort of, or, or even how do you plan to um, build the brand without necessarily focus on blockchain for the end user, but then have that door open for the inquisitive end user to have their questions answered. Sure. So I so 
to your point, it does depend on the application. Certain applications are for more advanced uh, users for whom it's important to know how the blockchain is working uh, very uh, intimately. I think in our application, what we are trying to do is take blockchain to the next level, right? How does blockchain get to a much bigger, wider appeal? And how does it help to, uh, you know, serve people uh, in a way that it was originally, that was the intention, right? You know, often right. the technology can become, um, you know, enamored with itself and everybody mm -hmm. starts uh, really just uh, talking about the technology, but then nobody's talking about how are you going to use it for the end user. And I think that, you know, having uh, an expectation that everyone's going to know everything about blockchain is not going to work. So how do we get people to use it while still maintaining the advantages of blockchain. And that's what we are trying to do, is that the end user uh, can see an interface, but in the back, you know, all the auditing, all the transparency, all the automation that comes from the use of blockchain, and the idea that we don't control the funds, and there's a lot of these benefits that, you know, we will educate the user on these benefits, but we don't want the fact that it's blockchain to be a hindrance to anyone from using it. Right, we have to be careful that people may say, "Oh, okay, I don't understand blockchain, so now I'm not, not going to use it." But right. to the extent that someone's interested, and you know, there are many uh, reasons why blockchain is superior in this case. As you scale up this platform, as you have many different types of uh, end users and insurers and banks using it, uh, in many cases we have had discussions where a you know the insurer is working a, you know as a partnership with the government to come out with uh, insurance. The government would want to have, you know, transparent auditing of the process. This makes it very easy to do that. So there are various benefits that come from, you know, especially when you start operating in places where trust levels are low to begin with. And, uh, you know, that's where the benefit of blockchain comes in, but not every user can be expected to know. But if it works well for the farmer, let's say, but it also has added benefits for the insurer, that's where we feel that the, where the blockchain really comes uh, to the fore. Yeah. Right. It's really in the business to business side that you'll be expecting people to want to know and understand where blockchain yes. is involved. The business consumer side, the farmer on the end, you know, hopefully they would be relying on some local consultant or advisor to help them ensure yeah. that they're, you know, selecting services, uh, you know, to their to their best interest. Exactly. Awesome, awesome. Well, so let's talk a little bit more about the Arbol project here. Um, I was looking at the timeline. You guys are right up, in, we're in quarter one of 2019 here. It looks like you guys are, are fairly on track with things. Walk me through this a little bit. What is it you guys have done so far and where are you at today? Sure, so we have built, uh, you know, what you could call uh, the MVP. And uh, we are rapidly heading towards a live uh, release of the first version of the product. Uh, we are aiming to do a pilot uh, transaction with real money in about uh, two weeks, which will be an important step as well, where you know we can see the whole thing. And it, it is going to be for a farm uh, that, uh, you know, uh, a real life farm, so to speak. So, um, you know, that'll be an important step for us to uh, get through. And uh, we're confident everything has been uh, great so far. Uh, we also are working towards the second generation of the app and, uh, you know, along with mobile and all these other uh, features that we think, you know, are important to really start the next level of deployment. Um, we, you know, one of the key things that uh, for the second generation that we are focused on is uh, going back to what we are just talking about. For the end user, we want it to be uh, almost like an online banking application. So, uh, you know, if they don't want to, they don't have to interface with uh, cryptocurrencies. They don't have to interface with managing their own wallets and things like that. So, right. different, lots of different uh, things being tested out there. But we want it so someone logs in, you know, uh, funds their account, uh, engages in the con uh, weather contract, and then afterwards gets the funds back uh, based on what the weather happened. And that's it uh you know right. very little of uh, so all us dollars denominated everything yeah. is done in in yeah. you know, and, uh, recognizable formats yeah we will we'll be uh you know we have uh, already uh implemented stable coin support so that's the one of the steps for that um okay. you know using the gemini coin but we'll be looking at other stable coins as well 
uh, sure. depending on what uh, you know what the users want. Well, and you have a marketplace that you're setting up for the insurers too, which I would imagine they have to fund some contracts in order to participate in some way. Yeah, so the I mean, you know, the, that's the goal of Arbol is to have an you know insurers, capital providers such as asset managers on one side, and farmers, agribusinesses, uh, energy businesses on the other side. That's the sort of uh, medium term goal. And so initially, it you know we may uh, you know we're talking to a number of partners. Initially, maybe it's a smaller partnership of uh, you know uh, insurers who come on board. Uh, we're in those conversations. We're exploring what's the best way to get started, uh, and then over time build out to a bigger platform as and when we expand to new regions. Gotcha. Now, is there a significant cost benefit as far as farmers comparing this to current insurances? Sure. So one thing that, uh, you know, we are doing uh, initially is going after the segments of the markets that actually don't really have any insurance. So okay. and like, like I said, uh, given that a trillion dollars of crops go uninsured every year globally, there are large pockets of uh, areas and crops and, uh, you know, uh, farmers who actually have very little currently to avail themselves. Uh, secondly, you know, given that we are data driven, uh, the costs are much lower than, you know, some expensive private insurance type, uh, you know, options. So, you know, there are large areas of the U.S. with the big crops, corn, soybeans, wheat, that have uh, very highly subsidized government crop insurance. And that's not an area that we, uh, you know, uh, are going to be uh, basically touching in the near future because, uh, you know, we find that lots of crops in the U.S., uh, such as, uh, you know, watermelons or uh, lettuce and other specialty crops don't really have great uh, insurance options. And so uh, those are great markets for us to first start with, as well as in other countries, you know, the insurance penetration is extremely low. Uh, and so that gives us a, you know, a good area to start with in terms of where we can uh, really make an impact initially without having to compete with very established, uh, you know, government programs. Right, right. Now, what about things like the people might be growing in greenhouses? That'd be a little bit different kind of, of coverage, uh, potentially a lot less expensive, right? Because you've got such sheltering happening. But, you know, if a tree falls down and damages a greenhouse or, if, you know, high winds come through and damage panels, things like that, would, would that be something you guys are addressing? Uh, somewhat. Uh, it would have to be, uh, you know, an event where the data can be measured in an objective way. So it's, uh, you know, if you can't measure it uh, from data, then it, it will need traditional insurance. So like a tree falling is not uh, really feasible, but high winds certainly. The thing right. though is, you know, greenhouses are a growing trend, but for now uh, and for the near future, they are a minuscule part of the global production values. Got so, it. you know, you look at uh, most of the world still essentially is outdoor grows and most of the world still lacks, uh, you know, uh, effective irrigation. So right. you, you have large, you know, we have very, very large markets we can address uh, even in our current uh, setup. Okay. All right. Excellent. Excellent. So now what does this, um, what, what does this look like for you guys to go to market? Are you going to be, um, you know, going with a partner and approaching their clients, or are you going to be cold calling these farmers that are underinsured? How's your, what's your plan there? Uh, initially, uh, most, uh, you know, most likely partnership. We do we do get interest from uh, farmers already. Like I said, we're going to do a pilot with a farm. Mm -hmm. oh. How uh, much uh, you know reception we've gotten from the farming community? How much need there is? Um, but you know, in in terms of reaching a wider audience, uh, likely we first uh, try to find some partners who we can uh, you know tap into their client networks or help them uh, you know add new crops and new regions that they previously would not have. But this is uh, you know that's that's part of this the you know the 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 real sort of way this project uh, you know transforms uh, you know people's lives in a big way is by finding the right stakeholders who we can work with 
to bring this to a much wider audience than to do smaller uh, one-off uh, cold call type trades. Gotcha. And, and, and can you talk about any of the data providers that you would be using currently or will in the future? Sure. So we use, uh, you know, a number of uh, government, uh, like federal government data sources, such as uh, some released by the NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Also some from uh, NASA that measures uh, rainfall on a global basis um, and uh, others that, you know, might be for a specific to a country, like some in Australia, for example, uh, released by the Bureau of, uh, Bureau of Meteor Meteorology. So the data sources, you know, uh, I have a fair bit of experience with these, and we are going to basically, uh, you know, use the best uh, data source for uh, a given region. Luckily, in the U.S., we actually have some government-driven, uh, data-driven insurance programs where they use data sets that have worked well. So we have a good path to follow there. Got it. Got it. Okay. And... Um... What does this look like for the end user? They're going to go in and what are they doing with your application? Do they have to connect with some kind of sensors, take some pictures? Is there any hardware that they need to have on site? Uh, not at all. I can share a screen if that uh, oh, sure. it's easier. Our uh, second generation app. Let me see if I can. We have uh, our. Um, let's see. Do you see it? Region selector, request yeah. a quote. So yeah. this is, um, you know, this is our uh, next generation apps uh, mock-up. We have the MVP, as I said, already built, but this will be a little bit more uh, detailed on how we can uh, sort of, uh, you know, give, visualize what the farmer would see. So this is our farmer view, and you can see this is a region of Australia, for example's sake. You select a little box. Um, and depending on the data source, this box's size can be a little larger or smaller, but the standard is uh, 0.25 degree latitude longitude, uh, which is about, uh, call it 12 to 13 mile, uh, square mile uh, radius. Uh, we have actually data sets that are even more uh, better. Okay. Uh, or, or, more know, granular. Smaller, yep. um, I'm trying to see, hold on. Sorry, uh, one second. Sure. Okay. And uh, now you see there's the uh, you know uh, time period you can pick. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that appear on the screen? Yep. So so it would be like okay, I my risk is in November for rainfall, and it will tell you this is for rainfall, and you know you have sort of it'll show you what the historical rainfall has been on all the years over the past thirty years or longer. And you can say, okay, for every 1% of normal that I'm lower on rainfall, I wish to be paid $1. So, you know, if, uh, but uh, starting at 75% normal, this is just an example, but okay. you can see this chart will show your payouts. So if you have 75% of normal rainfall, it's, uh, that's when you start getting paid. And as you go, and as the rainfall gets lower and lower, you get paid $1 more. It can also be all or nothing, you know, where it's just a square box. So anything lower than 75, and suddenly you get paid the full 100. Um, and you can see uh, you know, every year what you would have gotten paid. And this is important because you know, it's really important for the end user to understand the data sets we're using and to make sure that it matches their historical experience. That you know, when I point to, you can see here, 2002, right? Yeah. OK, so that should be in the in the farmer's mindset, that should be like, okay, that was a big drought, and it was right. in, in Australia. But like, it, it, that should the data should match historical experience. And I think sometimes that's where you know a lot of these things can go uh, wrong is if you get too abstract. We want to keep things really simple. This is rainfall. It should match your historical experience. Right. Um, and you know, the, then you can sort of see my quote requests. You know what what so you request a quote from different insurers, uh, and uh, you try to sort of uh, get you know a, a range of pricing from all the insurers who are interested in providing this. Mm -hmm. um, you can see what the ones you have done in the portfolio. You know, uh, we uh, here, and then you have some social stuff like news feeds and. Uh, you know. So now, does somebody do an annual contract for these, or can they do like a five-year or a 
we 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 are happy to add different ones because it's all just data based in general even like uh, crop futures markets and stuff are uh, generally one year ahead there's not a lot of activity beyond that because the uncertainty grows considerably after that you may be even planting right. a different crop farmers right. switch crops all the time so oh, okay. you know you most i i project i project that most of the demand will be for the current season so you're if you're you know just before planting time you're doing it for around the growing season and things like that okay so so those those averages and means can adjust year over year so as the average rainfall might actually go up or go down then the thresholds would be adjusted absolutely and that's why we do everything as percent of normal rather right. than hard numbers because yeah like some places will have a trend in rainfall and so the averages will keep uh, you know changing right interesting and this is an example of our weather forecast that we'll have uh, you know uh, where you know we want to provide the supporting analytics, uh, the best weather forecast. And this is a yet another area. There's a lot of growth. There's a lot of uh, you know, new techniques coming out to use uh, different data sets and uh, different machine learning techniques to get much better uh, local weather forecasts. Right. You know? So all those data sources you mentioned earlier are kind of your baseline. And then as you find new innovative sources of data, you can add them to the marketplace? Absolutely, but and and one one distinction is that the 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 contract itself pays out on actual data, not on forecast. The right. forecasts are there to help the farmer, uh, you know, sort of figure out okay, what's the likely uh, what's happening right. over the next ten days. This is another way for them to help, uh, you know, have the platform help them with other things, not just getting insurance, but weather forecast. Obviously, is uh, an extremely important service for them. So we want to provide that uh, as an add-on. Right. Now, that weather prediction component is also a benefit to the insurers, right, as they define the contracts and the risk variables. Absolutely. OK. So, wow. Yeah, so it's pretty, I mean, and, and so, I mean, it sounds like you guys are really ready to go. You've got some pilots going on um, coming up pretty soon here. And what's your, I mean, do you expect to have more clients on before the end of the year? Are you looking at different? Um, towns, governments, states, or regions that are looking for public-private partnership with you guys? Absolutely. Uh, you know, so we are uh, exploring on a number of fronts, lots of different uh, interests from banks, insurers to, uh, you know, one, uh, smaller sort of farming cooperatives and so on. So, and in different regions, you know, the methodology is also different. You have to really make sure you, and that's where the team, uh, going back to what we were talking about, you know, I have a fair bit of experience in commodities. Uh, my COO has uh, a much longer, three times as much. He's been in commodities for, um, you know, close to 30 years now and really understands uh, emerging markets in, in very deep detail. Um, so you, you know, you want to deploy the product in different ways uh, based on how the region operates. So in, in, for example, emerging markets, there are a number of folks who are, uh, or firms that act as aggregators, like micro lending firms, like NGOs, and they are the better interface there than trying to do the smallholder farmer. You know that that's that takes an incredibly long amount of time, and that's not an expertise that we have necessarily. So we want to right. interface with the micro lender who's done all the hard work, and it's in their interest that these farmers also have some protection from adverse weather. Um, whereas in U.S., you know, you have agents who the farmers trust for their insurance needs will interface with the agents here. And, uh, you know, it's a different process in Brazil. It's a different process in Australia. So lots of different, con uh, you know, movement happening. And as I said, yeah, like pilots and, you know, uh, different sort of stakeholders and discussion to bring on to the platform. Right, right. Now, speaking of that, do you guys have any uh, competition that you're aware of right now? Are there other sort of marketplaces like this trying to launch, blockchain or non-blockchain? Uh, not that we know of, uh, not in a marketplace form. There are sm uh, you know, sm uh, startups like ours doing uh, data-driven insurance in the weather space, parametric insurance as it's called. And you know, the marketplace is so big because there's so much of the market is uh, essentially left uh, open that you know we don't we welcome 
them helping you know farmers in their regions and uh yeah most of them are very uh, niche like you know wine in france or olives in spain things like that and so it's uh, it's a good sign that you know in, in any of these we are seeing demand really take off farmers are uh, very very excited about these products you know you've seen um you know one of these sort of data driven insurance products from the us government become a top 10 us da program and uh, it's only for uh, forage so uh, and livestock grazing land and yet it became a top 10 program uh, doing two and a half billion dollars of crop value so what you're seeing is the adoption is starting to really take off and that's why we think that uh, you know for us the data is there the uh, farmer knowledge is there the adoption is ready and blockchain is maturing so we think that this is the right combination to build a large marketplace Gotcha. Yeah, no, I think you're I think you're definitely on to stuff here. This is uh, pretty exciting. So I think we should wrap it up. I don't want to uh, keep people going too long here. We want to keep this digestible. Um, but I just want to kind of summarize through, you know, basically, you guys are really solving or disintermediating the people who need insurance coverage, especially um, due to uh, crop variations in the farming and agricultural space, and connecting data providers, and insurers to cover this and in the yep. process eliminating a whole lot of um bureaucracy uh actuarial tables kind of becoming uh, a different a thing of the past or sort of morphing into something new with real-time dynamic data and and it's and it's potentially allowing us to get a whole lot of people that are uh unable to acquire or afford insurance to get access to it for our food supplies and other agricultural needs. Yeah, absolutely, and, and beyond agriculture, lots of other industries, as uh, we have pointed out there. And at the end of the day, you know, these needs are going to grow rapidly as you know we face climate change and as uh, the weather becomes uh, more uh, sort of un, uh, you know volatile in various places. In a lot of places, you have seen massive changes in. Uh, sort of the crop patterns and other examples of climate change. You you know you can grow soybeans far more north now than you used to be able to. Uh, Siberia continues to be a bigger wheat producer. The Middle East, there's a lot of drying out happening. Lots of you know examples of that. I think as climate change takes hold, and you know seventy percent of all businesses are affected by weather, uh, not just agriculture. Uh, you know retail, tourism, energy. Um, the need for effective insurance solutions against unexpected weather uh, is going to grow in importance. And, uh, you know, we hope to be a part of the solution for that. Absolutely. Now, one, one other thing here, can people um, like myself or some other investor basically participate in this market? I mean, they're not writing an insurance contract. They're not analyzing the data, but they're looking at the risk variables, maybe making a prediction of their own. And, and putting a stake behind that prediction, uh, can people participate in that way? And can you also use the data from those predictions to give you better accuracy? Um, sure, yeah, absolutely. I think as volumes on the platform grow, we'll continue to open it up to a larger and larger base of uh, investors. Uh, we've already had a lot of interest from uh, non-insurance like asset managers and uh, hedge funds type, type uh participants and the reason is that uh, you know the the return you get from this is not correlated to stock and bond markets and right. that's the benefit. correlated marketplace yeah and uh you know you can earn uh, if you can diversify and that's the goal for us is get uh agricultural businesses and other businesses from lots of different regions to create a portfolio essentially that's uh, well diversified so even though for the farmer it's very local insurance uh, but, you know, to get good pricing, if you can uh, lump together, you know, a little bit of weather insurance in Iowa, a little bit in Vermont, a little bit in South Africa, and a little bit in Australia, now you have a very diversified portfolio getting you returns on the investor side, while each of those farmers managed to get localized insurance that they did not have before. So that's, you know, that's the... the the, the benefit for both sides. And so as the volume volumes grow, we'll increase the pool of investors that, uh, you know, uh, some of it is regulatory, but we'll make sure that everybody who participates, uh, you know, is legally allowed to do so and so on.
on. So that's why we want to roll it out uh, in stages. Awesome, awesome. And we've been on arbolmarket.com. Uh, is that the best way or are there any other ways that people should uh, reach out to keep in, in contact, keep updated on, on Arbol pro projects here? Uh, that, that, that's a great way, as well as we have a number of social channels at Arbol Market on Twitter and uh, Medium and uh, I think LinkedIn, yeah. So awesome. Awesome. So people can uh, connect on there, LinkedIn, on, uh, on Twitter, and on Medium. And uh, I, I definitely encourage folks to keep tabs on this because this is definitely the future in insurance technologies and uh, these marketplaces. So I really appreciate you joining us today, Sin. Uh, Sid, thanks for having us on. And uh, to the rest of our audience, thank you for joining us on Interchain Live. It's been uh, wonderful having you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.